Some of you will have seen the recent videos I did looking at the HP97 and Electronica MS1103 calculators, both of which didn't work. I will return to those machines at some point in time. I've got some fresh things to check on the Electronica, but I'm still scratching my head regarding the HP. Anyway, in the meantime I have another calculator in need of attention, this rather lovely Hitachi KK561, which was made in Japan somewhere around 1972. As is the now familiar tradition, it doesn't work. If I turn it on, all I get is a load of decimal points in the display and the three warning lights. I was somehow expecting this one to be an easy fix, but as is often the case, things aren't always quite as straightforward as expected. I've been working on this calculator on and off for a couple of weeks now, so some of the clips may seem a bit disjointed, but I'll try to give a brief rundown on what I've discovered so far. The first thing was to open the calculator up for inspection, and I have to say that this machine is the best designed calculator I've worked on for serviceability. There are two machine screws going into brass inserts that allow you to open the front edge. Then the cover slides backwards slightly to release the rear clips, allowing you to open the top up to vertical. Of course, what would be nice is if you could then lay the top down flat to test the calculator. Well, they thought of that. There's this little bit of plastic tube that some excess wire is pushed into. Remove that tube and then there's enough wire left to open the cover flat. Brilliant! But it gets better. To remove the main circuit board, there's a multi-pin plug connecting the power supply to the board. Then you move these two plastic runners forward, and these are the only thing holding the board into the case. This allows you to lift the front edge up slightly to remove the edge connector to the keyboard. And then the entire circuit board just lifts out. Which is very handy, because I think I've removed the board about a million times so far. Anyway, when I first opened the case I spotted that there were lots of blobs of grease that had fallen off the keys and onto the circuit board, and I had the vague hope that one of these blobs might be conductive enough to short the pin of a chip to ground or something like that, causing the calculator not to work. So I spent some time cleaning the grease off the PCB and any blobs still hanging on the keyboard, and once that was all done I powered the calculator back up again and it made no difference at all. But I always like to start with the blooming obvious, because all too often that's where the fault lies. And while we're looking at the keyboard, the one on this calculator uses magnetic read switches rather than a physical contact system. The key stem has a magnet which moves with the key, and if I've got my microphone positioned correctly, you should be able to hear the ping of the read switch as the contacts close and open. Next was to check some voltages. VGG was something like 13.8 volts. You can ignore what's displayed on the meter for the other two voltages. The high voltage for the VFD tubes enters the board at about 40 volts AC and is rectified by the diodes under the cluster of wires coming out of the connector. And finally there's a 5 volt AC supply for the heater filaments in the VFD tubes. One thing I did notice was what could be leakage deposits from one of the smoothing capacitors, so I'll order spare capacitors for the entire machine, remove and test all the current caps, and replace any that are off their specified value, or give any cause for concern. I can always return the machine to original specification later if needed. OK, now for a quick progress report. I've removed and checked all the capacitors. Generally they read more or less the correct values. I've replaced the two that smoothed the high voltage supply for the VFDs. The capacitor over here does the power on reset, and although it read the correct value, I wasn't sure if the reset was resetting correctly, so I've popped a fresh cap in for now. I couldn't get an axial capacitor of the correct value, so I had to put this radial one in, but it's a bit unsightly, so I'll probably change it back at some time. There were a couple here and here that were supposed to be 22 microfarads, and they both read something like 47 microfarads, which is a bit odd, so I've replaced those. 
I've also replaced the capacitors in the power supply that creates the VGG voltage, just to see if I could reduce the ripple at all, but it's made precious little difference, if any. I might leave the replacement capacitors in the power supply just as a precautionary measure, but I'll think about that later. I've been through the calculator probing every pin on every chip to see what's going on which pins were power, which were clock or other timing signals, which pins showed signs of data and so on. And there were a lot of pins showing signs of life, and there's even more discoveries still to be made. I'd found various pins that reacted to pressing certain keys. The yellow channel is showing pin 4 of chip HD3290P, and you can see that the trace briefly goes low on each key press. And while I was checking each key, everything suddenly stopped working, and pressing further keys did nothing. I also noticed that the trace of that final press had a spike that none of the others had. I turned off and on again, and everything was working. It took me a couple of goes to realise that I could press the number keys 16 times, and on the 17th press I would see the spike. And how many digits are in the display? 16. So the 17th press overflows the display. From that I figured pressing the clear key might release the keyboard. And indeed it did. So the calculator is definitely working, to some extent anyway. More investigation required. After that I carried on probing pins, this time entering data at the same time, and I had another breakthrough. I've got the scope connected to pins 3 and 8 on chip HD3292P. Pin 3 is the top trace, which is showing one of the clocks. So, if I key in 541, which is a little bit difficult because I'm doing it by feel as the keyboard is upside down, but anyway, I'll just freeze that, and what you're looking at is the contents of the register that should be on the display at the moment. It's in binary coded decimal. There would be another clock showing where each digit should start, but I've only got a two-channel scope, so you'll just have to imagine the clock being divided into groups of four. The first pulse represents eight, the second represents four, the third two, and the fourth one. So looking at the trace, we've got nothing on the eight, then a pulse on the four, nothing on the two, and a pulse on the one, making five. Then we move on to the next digit, there's nothing on the eight, a pulse on the 4, and nothing on the 2 and 1. And finally, the last digit. We've got nothing on the 8, 4 or 2, but a single pulse on the 1, giving us the number we entered of 541. Next, if I unfreeze the scope again and press the memory plus button, if I can actually find the correct key by feel, and now clear the calculator, leaving the register empty, I'll now enter 953 and freeze the trace on the scope, and take a copy that I can put on screen now. And there's our 953. I haven't fully understood how the logic on this calculator works, but the contents of the working register, and what's in memory, are constantly being pumped round the machine, and you can read it from various pins round the calculator. Anyhow, if I unfreeze the scope again, and press the memory recall, if I can find the right key. We're now back to 541. So everything seems to be working, apart from the bit that drives the display and the three warning indicators. So after that I turned my attention to the display driving section. I knew that the grid drivers were working because I'd already checked those, but the segment drivers weren't. And, when I say I, I actually mean we, because my brother has done a lot of the digging for information on the chips, and all the clever stuff. He's just not silly enough to have a YouTube channel, so all you get to see is me. Anyway, the display driving section is up at the top of the board. These two modules drive the grids, and the module over here drives the segments. As far as I'm aware, these are just dumb switching modules, so the problem lies with one of the chips in front of them. The HD3233P, amongst other things, drives these three transistors, which should turn on and off the three warning lights, but these are permanently illuminated. If I connect one probe up to pin 9, and the second channel to pin 10, and turn on, you'll see both channels go low. 
Now, if I add something into the memory, pin 9 goes to ground, but pin 10 doesn't move. Pin 10 should be the inverse of pin 9. When there's nothing in the memory, pin 10 should be grounded, thereby turning the memory indicator off. If I now clear the memory, pin 9 goes back to 13 volts, or minus 13 volts, but again pin 10 doesn't move. I've now swapped the probes onto pin 14 of HD3233P and pin 14 of HD3253P. And turn on. And there should be an enable signal going from 3233 to 3253, but it just sits there at minus 13 volts, and I suspect it should be grounding these pins to enable the 3253. All the segments are controlled by 3253, but all the outputs are at zero volts, so nothing is being displayed. So, from what we can tell, there's a problem with the HD3233P chip over here. The keen-eyed among you may have spotted that the chip is now mounted in a socket. We, or rather my brother, removed the chip, partly to see what the tracks did beneath the chip, and partly to allow the addition of the socket. I've tracked down a random circuit board from an unknown piece of equipment that has some of these chips on it. When the board arrives, we'll remove one of these chips and plug it into the socket, and with a bit of luck, the calculator will suddenly burst into life. If the problem, however, actually lies in the HD3253P chip, then that will be a bit trickier, because that appears to be a somewhat rarer chip. Anyway, that's about all I can do for now. If you've enjoyed watching, please like the video, and maybe even subscribe to the channel, not forgetting to click on the bell icon so you don't miss the follow-up video when it's released, hopefully fairly soon. That's it for now, so thanks for watching, and I'll see you in a future video.